to all. Today we'll be discussing cardiac MRI and its role in cardiovascular disease. I am Dr. Karthik, Associate Professor of Cardiology from UN Mehta Hospital. Now MRI, cardiac MRI in itself is a huge topic. So we'll be touching upon the physics of MRI as well as the basic MRI protocol which is followed. So the first question is why cardiac MRI? So among all the imaging modalities, why cardiac MRI is one of the best imaging modality available? Because it has a high soft tissue contrast, availability of a large field of vision, multiplanar acquisition capabilities, excellent spatial and temporal resolution, lack of ionizing radiation, non-invasiveness, wide range of cardiovascular applications, anatomical and functional diagnosis. This is the basic model of a cardiac MRI. Now all of you would have undergone an MRI, most of us would have undergone an MRI at some point of time. So this is the sample table on which the patient lies. Okay, this foot is towards this uh, uh, the rest and the, the head goes into the gantry or the large bore. Now the magnet which you see, which is marked magnet, okay, is the primary magnet. Now this magnet remains on at all times. Okay, even if you switch off the power of the MRI, okay, this magnet will continue to be on because this is a superconductor. It has liquefied helium, which is designed to provide the magnetic field at all times. Now the strength of the magnet generally is a 1.5 Tesla or a 3 Tesla. Then you have these gradient coils. The gradient coils are very important because they provide or produce magnetic gradients along the three axes, that is the X axis, the Y axis and the Z axis. Now the Z axis is along the direction of the primary magnetic field which is provided by this magnet and that is known as the B0 magnetic field which I'll show you in the next slide. The B0 magnetic field is directed from the head to the foot of the patient and the gradient coils also provide gradients along the X and the Y axis. Then you have these radio frequency coils. Now the radio frequency coils are important because they provide a radio frequency pulse and this radio frequency pulse is transmitted to a receiver and this receiver coil is strapped to the chest of the patient. Now the patient is not shown here so you cannot see the radio frequency receiver coil but it is strapped to the chest of the patient. This is how this is what I told you so you have an X axis, Y axis and a Z axis and you have this primary magnetic field directed uh, towards from the head to the foot of the patient okay and the patient lies uh, like this on the MRI table. Now what is the basic physics of an MRI? So in the body you have as you know the body is composed of water in the in water you have uh, protons or hydrogen ions every proton is a potential magnet because it has a north pole and a south pole it acts a dipole for the purpose of MRI we will call these protons as spins now in the body what happens is whenever the body is not exposed to any magnet you have these protons which are in a random movement and each of the proton will cancel out the other proton and since, since uh, because of that the net magnetization would be zero but whenever the patient enters a magnetic field what happens is that some of the protons will orient themselves in the direction of the primary magnet some of the protons will orient themselves in the opposite direction most of the protons would cancel out each other but in the end you have some protons which will be directed towards or a net number of protons or spins which will be directed towards the primary magnetic field okay and this is the depiction of these protons towards the magnetic field along the z axis now you need to know a very important concept which is referred to as a larmor frequency now these protons when they are oriented along the z axis or the z axis it is not only that it is oriented it also is continu continuously spinning or oscillating around its long axis now this at the frequency at which this protons would oscillate is known as the larmor frequency now how do you calculate this larmor frequency and what is the importance of this larmor frequency so whenever you talk about larmor frequency the the calculation is gamma into b0 where gamma is a gyromagnetic constant the value of gamma is given by 40, is 42.6 megahertz per tesla and B0 is the strength of the magnetic field. If it is a 1.5 Tesla MRI, your gyromagnetic constant being fixed, okay, the Larmor frequency would be around 64 megahertz. And if it's a 3 Tesla MRI, your Larmor frequency would be around 127 megahertz. So if you keep, or if the gyromagnetic ratio is constant, the frequency is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. 
So what is the importance of this Larmor frequency? To understand that, we need to know another concept known as resonance. Now this resonance is a universal concept, it does not only apply to a cardiac MRI, it applies to all things in physics. So imagine a tuning fork, now you have one tuning fork, you have activated this tuning fork and you bring this tuning fork very close to another tuning fork. Now the frequency of vibration of the first tuning fork will be picked up by the second tuning fork and it will also start vibrating at a particular frequency. Now for this tuning fork that will be the Larmor frequency. So similar to that, okay, for a proton, when you have a particular Larmor frequency exposed to a magnetic field, okay, that becomes that proton's Larmor frequency. So all the protons which are oriented towards the magnetic field will oscillate at that same frequency. So what is the importance of this Larmor frequency? Now comes the importance uh, of the radio frequency coil or the radio frequency magnet. Now this radio frequency coil is going to give a very small radio frequency pulse or energy. Now the, the importance or the need to give this energy is because this proton, if you imagine, it is rotating around this Z axis, right? Now all the MRI images are captured in the XY plane. So you need to topple this proton from the Z axis to the XY plane. Now how do you do this? You do this by applying a very small radio frequency pulse which we talked about and this pulse or this energy is given exactly at the Larmor frequency because if you don't give it at the Larmor frequency, the proton will just ignore it, will not take up this energy. So the energy at which this radio frequency pulse is given, okay, will be equal to the Larmor frequency. Now once you give this pulse, the proton is going to topple down, just like a top, it is going to topple down from the Z axis to the XY axis, okay, and then you can use this proton's energy to take or get MRI images. So this is how it exactly works. So you have this proton at the in the Z axis and you give a small radio frequency pulse. Now the, the pulse can be decided or can be controlled by us. So, so you can give a 90 degree pulse, radio frequency pulse, which you generally give in case of uh, a spin echo sequences, or you can give an inversion pulse or a 180 degree radio frequency pulse as in case of a inversion recovery sequence. Now the other very important concept which you need to know is Faraday's law of induction. Now this is 8th class physics which just shows that if you have a magnet and you bring this another inside another magnet and you have a copper coil which goes around the primary magnet then this magnetic field or magnetic pulse will be picked up by the copper coil and it will be converted into a voltage. So you can see that these voltage changes are reflected on this uh, galvanometer. So this is the basis of producing an MRI image that this voltage which is picked up by the copper coil and uh, these voltage sequences are sensed and they are converted into MRI images. Now what is free induction decay? Now once the proton takes up this radio frequency pulse is toppled down to the XY axis, it will start, it will uh, have this energy for a very short time till the pulse is applied. Now once you stop giving the radio frequency pulse, the proton is going to dissipate its energy into the surrounding lattice and will try to come back to the Z axis. So this decay of energy is referred to as a free induction decay. Now after you have stopped giving the radio frequency pulse, the proton will try to return back to its original position in the Z axis, right? So now brings us to the concept of relaxation. Now there are two kinds of relaxation. One is a transverse relaxation, another is a longitudinal relaxation. The longitudinal one is referred to as T1 and the transverse is referred to as T2. Now the basis of the longitudinal relaxation is simple that you have stopped giving, you have stopped giving the patient the radio frequency pulse and now the proton is going to come back to the Z axis. Now the time taken for 63% of the proton magnetic field to recover to its original magnetic field, that is T1 relaxation and that is the time taken for it to achieve 64% of its prior primary magnetization will be the T1 time. Whereas transverse relaxation is along the Z axis or the XY axis sorry and that is because of two reasons one is a spin spin interaction and the other is magnetic field inhomogeneity. So the magnetic field inhomogeneity is because every proton may not experience the same magnetic field which is experienced by one proton, okay, you may have the various protons experiencing various magnetic field uh, energies, okay, and the other is that every proton will interact with its surrounding proton. So before actually 
the, the, uh, the primary magnetization is recovered to the z-axis. You have most of the energy dissipated in the lattice, okay, and that is known as transverse relaxation of the T2 time, okay. So T1 is longer, T2 is generally shorter, okay, and depending upon the the, cons the component in the body, for example, you have fat, you have water, you have lipid, every component of the body will have a different relaxation time. So what is the normal relaxation time now? For a T1 in a normal 1.5 Tesla MRI, the T1 is generally 850 to 950 milliseconds and in a 3 Tesla MRI, it is 1050 to 1150 uh, seconds, milliseconds. And if you talk about T2, the normal T2 is around 25 to 30 milliseconds. Now, if you take into account lipid, muscle and water, always remember LMW or low molecular weight as we remember for low molecular weight heparin. For T1, as you go from lipid to muscle to water, the T1 relaxation gradually increases. So the lipid will have the shortest T1, the muscle will have a slightly increased T1, and the water will have uh, the largest T1. Now mind you, this water which we are talking about is actually the intracellular edema or the trapped water. It is not blood. Okay. Uh, for the T2, it is just op you have to switch muscle and lipid. Muscle has the uh, shortest T2 time. Lipid has a slightly longer T2 time and uh, water has the largest T2 time. Now we come to the concept of an MR eco. Now what is an MR eco? Now what the MR machine does is it converts this free induction decay into more of a, a diamond shaped uh, uh, structure which we'll see which is done in two ways one is a spin eco and other is a gradient eco this is how a spin eco sequence looks like okay so you give a 90 degree pulse okay and then you have a refocus refocusing 180 degree radio frequency pulse so what happens is that all the blood images okay they appear black so spin eco is for black blood imaging okay the blood appears black in a spin eco sequence Whereas in a gradient echo, what you have is you give a 90 degree radio frequency pulse and then you have another pulse in the opposite direction, okay, and that is to get very fast echoes, right? So that is uh, seen as a, uh, uh, again, a diamond shaped curve. So this is the difference between a spin echo and a gradient echo. Uh, the flip angle is, is always 90 degree in a spin echo, where it, whereas it can be variable in a gradient echo. There is a refocusing pulse in a spin echo, whereas it is not present in a gradient echo. The contrast weighing now, Spin echo is used for T1, T2 and proton density where the blood appears black okay, or dark whereas in a gradient echo it is used for T1 and T2 star images where the blood will appear bright. So the cardiac applications as I have already told you is T1 and T2 for the basic anatomical details and the imaging and tissue characterization a spin echo is used whereas if you want to uh, do fast cine imaging or contrast enhanced MR angiography or flow imaging or T2 star for ion imaging which is the, the hallmark of T2 star imaging you need to use gradient echos. Now before we go into the MRI protocol what are the contraindications of an MRI? So electrically or mechanically activated implant it could be a pacemaker, it could be an insulin pump, biostimulator, it could be a cochlear implant. Now mind you you have this MRI compatible pacemakers so whenever you talk about MRI compatible pacemakers you need to know what is the specific absorption decay of that particular uh, particular pacemaker because there is a specific value over which it should not exceed and specific absorption uh, value of that particular pacemaker uh, uh, above which it should not go. So it may be a 1.5 watt per kg or it may be 2 watt per kg depending upon the pacemaker and the MRI which has to be done. But you need to know the specific absorption rate of that particular pacemaker to decide whether that MRI, uh, whether that pacemaker is MRI compatible or not. Then other uh, like a metallic foreign body in the eye, metal, metal shrapnel or bullet. Then ferromagnetic aneurysmal clips, titanium clips are MR safe and pregnancy, the risk benefit ratio you need to know. You can do an MRI in pregnancy but you need to know the benefit, you need to clearly document the, the indication of an MRI and try to avoid gadolinium enhancement. Now we come to the choice of the imaging sequence. As I told you, you have static images and you have cine images. For static images, the, the vendor from which you've got the MRI machine, whether it is Siemens, GE or Philips, the, the sequence are named differently. So you have these ultra fast gradient eco localizers, you have single shot turbo six spin eco, you have inversion recovery especially which you use for nulling fat or uh, lipid, then you have gradient eco multi slice and you have this SSFP multi slice. For the cine images you have 
एस एस एफ पी मल्टी फ्रेम स्पॉइल्ड ग्रीडियंट इको एंड अल्ट्रा फास्ट रियल टाइम इमेजिंग नाउ एज यू गो डाउन फ्रॉम एन एस एस एफ पी टू अ स्पॉइल ग्रीडियंट इको और अल्ट्रा फास्ट रियल टाइम इमेजिंग द टेम्पोरल एंड स्पेशल रेजोल्यूशन विल ग्रेजुअली गो डाउन बट दी द स्पीड ऑफ इमेजिंग विल इंक्रीज सो द नंबर ऑफ ब्रेथ होल्ड विल कम डाउन सो दिस इज जस्ट लाइक यू हैव यू नो इन एनी एनी थिंग इन कार्डियोलॉजी यू हैव अ बेसिक वे ऑफ डूइंग इट फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ यू आर डूइंग अ पीडियाट्रिक इको यू नीड टू स्टार्ट फ्रॉम द साइटस यू नीड टू लुक एट द आई वी सी यू नीड टू लुक एट द एटा एंड देन यू लुक एट द पलमी वेन्स एंड देन यू डू अ सिस्टमेटिक एग्जामिनेशन सिमिलर इज द केस विद एन एम आर आई ओके यू हैव दिस बेसिक थिंग्स विच यू नीड टू डू इन एनी एम आर आई और गिव इन एम एनी एम आर आई रिपोर्ट नो एज यू ग्रो यू नो ओल्डर एंड वाइसर एंड यू बिकम मोर एक्सपीरियंसड यू मे particularly look at certain things if you know know the basic history of the patient the echo of the patient okay but this is how an basic mri report should look like so we this is the basic mri imaging plane that we generally uh, do an mri you have an axial or transverse plane you have a coronal plane and you have a sagittal plane now the axial goes <coughs> from the uh, from the right to the left the sagittal goes you know from the uh, sternum to the spine and the coronal is from the head to the foot and this is the basic mri imaging planes in which the mri images are sliced so you have something known as localizers now you have a two chamber localizer now it cannot cannot be a general localizer you need to have a cardiac localizer so whenever you are taking images what is a two chamber localizer so the two chamber localizer you can see these two images right so this is like a four chamber image okay and you need to have this white line so this white line should be parallel to the septum okay it should go through the center of the lv and it should always be seen in two orthogonal views it should, it is a non cine single slice image which is ecg gated and with a single breath hold from the two chamber localizer you go to the short axis so you take a stack of short axis images uh, that that is more commonly said as a short of uh, uh, sh uh, stack uh, short axis stacks or cines okay but even in the scout you can have this series of images that you take where the angle is perpendicular to the septum the block is perpendicular to the line along the center of the mv mitral bar and the lv apex and it covers the heart from the mid la mid la going from to the lv apex <coughs> then you have a four chamber localizer the line crossing the center of the mitral valve in the lv apex and you have these various uh, yellow lines that you see the various slices which are taken okay and the line will cross the rv apex in the anterior papillary muscle and below the aorta <coughs> then you take the dark blood sequences as i have already told you the dark blood sequences are spin echo sequences so you have an ecg trigger and you have 8 mm thick slices that you take now you can take double inversion pulse or you can have a triple inversion pulse if you want to null the fat okay and uh, the data acquisition is in diastole and this is predominantly done when you want to take anatomical details good borders okay and you want to tissue characterize you take these dark blood sequences then you take the cine images now the cine images are typically your gradient echo sequences are very fast so you generally in all the mri machines you can have an ssfp that is steady state precision uh, frequency precision imaging which can give you very uh, good temporal excellent temporal and spatial resolution but it requires a little more breath hold so if you want to do it very fast you may go for uh, 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 you know a spoiled gradient echo also okay so these are the various ways you take the uh, a short axis you have a stack of short axis images that you take okay and short axis cine that you take and predominantly the function of taking the cine images is for lv function assessment and lv volume assessment then we go to the first pass perfusion study so the contrast is generally 0.1 to 0.2 millimole per kg of gadolinium at a rate of 3 to 7 ml per second with 30 ml saline bolus and you take three short axis view through the lv now once you have given the patient gadolinium you need to wait for 10 to 15 minutes before you obtain the lg images so between that what you can do is you can take the post contrast axial images and these are mainly to look at the extra cardiac structures for example in this case you have the ascending aorta the descending aorta and you have the mpa the rpa and the lpa so you look at any kind of lymphadenopathy and any extra thoracic structures that you may have missed while taking the scout images okay and you tend to uh, look at the lymphadenopathy and all the other things in these post contrast axial images then you can do a face contrast Im uh, Im uh, imaging of the aorta to look at the flow now this is generally used in valvular lesions where you need to quantify the mr quantify the ar quantify the pr so you can uh, take a face contrast image of the aorta in the lvot cine or the coronal scout 
two orthogonal views are always used and you need to know that you need this aorta to be completely in the center and uh, uh, circular and perpendicular to the aorta. And if you, uh, if you take this faith contrast for the pulmonary artery, it is done in the RVOT cinea or sagittal scout and in two orthogonal planes, again it has to be perfectly circular and just before the PA branching. Then after you, uh, you uh, do 8 minutes of contrast, you do a TI scout. This is known as the inversion scout, uh, which is a 16 to 20 heartbeats at every 43 milliseconds. Now if you look at the third image, you can see that you want the, the fat to be completely null. That is the myocardium should look completely black. Okay, so that is that will give you the ideal image from which you can tissue characterize, right? So for example, if you look at this first image, it is not completely black. You can see all the other things. So you need the myocardium to be completely black. Okay, that is the third image. Okay, and that is the uh, that is the uh, the the image where you look for the TI values or time inversion values. And this is my final slide. Uh, then we look for the LGE, that is the late gadolinium enhancement. So I'll not go into the detail of it. Okay, so you can see that uh, this is uh, the A and the B image is more suggestive of an ischemia or myocardial infarction where you have a subendocardial in this image. Okay, and you have a transmural infarct more suggestive of an MI. Whereas in the third and fourth images, you have patchy and diffuse, uh, you know, uh, mid-wall involvement. So generally indicative of a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, either a hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy. The fifth image is more of a sub-epicardial involvement and generally seen in myocarditis, okay, non-inflammatory or inflammatory myocarditis. And then you have this diffuse sub-endocardial involvement, which could be, uh, which could be seen in, uh, which could be uh, seen in uh, some conditions, okay, like drug-induced uh, myocarditis. So that is the images uh, uh, which you take. Uh, before I go, I'd like to tell you that we also have tissue characterization, okay, which can be done. Now, the SCMR has certain protocols for every, every condition. So, this protocol has to be followed in general. But if you know the history, if you know the, uh, the diagnosis or if you know the ECO, then you may not need to do all these things. Okay, for example, if you want to do, uh, say, of a DCM patient, then you, then you always do these CINE images uh, to understand the volumes and you also do an LG. Okay, but if you want to do a regurgitant lesions, then you need to do a phase contrast image of the aorta in the MP. Thank you.